Good evening. My name is Marini Brown, and I'm the outreach chair for the Young Alumni Leadership Council. On behalf of the council, I want to welcome you to UGA Young Alumni's Cooking with Peter Dell. We are excited you decided to spend the evening with us. Before we get into our program, I want to share a little bit about UGA Young Alumni. Our mission is to provide dynamic opportunities for young alumni to engage and give back to the University of Georgia. The engagement piece is done through the programs and events we host throughout the year, including our Between the Hedges programs, Young Alumni Night at Sweetwater, and Trivia Nights, which you'll hear more about later. Tonight, we'll be featuring UGA alumnus Peter Dell as he guides us through preparing three dishes that he has featured in his Athens restaurants. We know that many of you will be following along and cooking with Peter. We would love for you to share your experience through social media. Please share your pictures, tag UGA Young Alumni, and share with UGA Young Alumni, and also tag UGA Alumni. I can't wait to see all of the pictures of you all cooking with us. Throughout the year, we also seek to encourage alumni to give back to UGA. That can be anything from supporting a scholarship or research fund, giving to your school or college, or volunteering your time with the university. Tonight, we are featuring the Campus Kitchen at UGA and seeking to raise funds for a food trailer that will serve low-income communities in the Athens area. Not only will you hear from Campus Kitchen student volunteers and staff, but we have also started a Georgia funder with a goal of $2,500. With the Georgia funder, we can see real time the impact of our giving. As you can see, we have already raised over $1,000 for this cause thanks to your gifts through the registration page. We are just $1,500 away from the goal. To make the greatest impact, the UGA Young Alumni Council will match dollar for dollar funds given to the Georgia funder up to $2,500. So if we raise 2,500 through the Georgia funder, the Young Alumni Council will match it for a total of $5,000. With your help, it is our hope that we can raise all or most of the money for the food trailer doing this event. You can find the Georgia Funder link on the event streaming page. Thank you in advance for your help. With that said, I think we're ready to get started. First, let me introduce our featured alumnus, Peter Dell. Peter graduated from the University of Georgia in 1999 with an ABJ degree in public relations and soon after decided to pursue an interest in cooking. His love for travel and foods of many different cultures was fueled by his father, a New Yorker of Greek descent and mother, and these things inspire him today. His food career journey began with an apprenticeship at five and 10 in his hometown, Athens, Georgia. Through his education there, Peter was able to travel and held an internship at La Broche in Madrid, Spain. In 2007, Dell opened his first restaurant, The National, with five and 10 chef Hugh Aikman, Aikson in downtown Athens. Over the years, Peter has opened several other restaurants and food establishments, which you'll hear about in a bit. In 2012, he was named Food and Wine Magazine's The People's Best New Chef Southeast. That same year, he was honored by Star Chefs as an Atlanta area rising star chef and named to the University of Georgia's list of 40 under 40 alumni. In addition to culinary pursuits, Peter has served on the boards of the Athens Farmers Market, Grady College Alumni Board, Athens Made, Athens Community Career Academy, the Culinary Kitchen of Athens, and Wholesome Way, Georgia. Peter has two terriers named Ollie and Tobias and enjoys travel, music, and fitness. Welcome, Peter Dale. Hey, hey. Peter. How's it going? It's going great. How are you doing this evening? We're great. We're great. Excited to be here. And it's a little weird to hear your bio read out, so um, I'm glad that part's over. <laughs> Well, you know, you have such great achievements and we're so glad to have you here with us. Yeah. Uh, to, get, to get started, tell us about your time at Georgia. What was your major? Tell us more about your major and what were you yeah. involved in? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I actually grew up in Athens. So going to Georgia was kind of, uh, um, it, it was like continuing to live in Athens, but in this whole new way, um, which was, um, you know, I felt like growing up in Athens, I knew everything about UGA. And then when I got to Georgia and moved into the dorms and went to orientation, I realized I didn't know anything about what was going on on campus. Um, but I majored in public relations at Grady. And the thing that I learned was that, um, and actually later as I started cooking, that I really love um, storytelling and um, communicating with others. And I found that my medium wasn't um, necessarily the written word, but was through food. So um, Grady prepared me really well for um, this career, even though you know I'm not in a traditional journalism role or public relations role. Uh, and actually growing up in Athens, I was really involved in the 4-H club, which is part of the university. So I was involved in collegiate 4-H. Uh, and then uh, was also a campus tour guide at the Visitor Center for three years and met amazing friends through the Visitor Center, uh, had great experiences, and then also in Art Society. And I feel like the Visitor Center and Art Society um, are about hospitality and welcoming people um, to your space. And that really prepared me for um, being a restaurateur uh, and uh, making people feel comfortable and welcome and, and helping them uh, get what they need. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be here if it had not been for those experiences. That means so much. And you've proven through your story that your experience at school with um, at Georgia stays with you for a long time. We'd love to hear more about the specific moment where you decided to switch gears and move into oh. starting your own restaurant. Um, well, I, I had some really great experiences after college. I moved to Washington, D.C. and worked on Capitol Hill and then actually came back and worked at UGA and in, in administration. And then so I, I got into cooking pretty late. I was 25 when I decided to, to give this a try. And I just had this entered this creative energy that wasn't that I didn't have an outlet for at the time. And, uh, you know, so I wouldn't change my journey, but it definitely was not the most direct path to cooking. Um, so I think I was sitting at my desk one day and I was like, I, I just I need to do something with my hands. And, and, and actually, right now, I'm kind of have my hands behind my back. But normally, I'm a very like sort of expressive talker. So I just needed to be doing something with my hands. And so I think one day I was just like, I need to give cooking a try. I love entertaining my family, always entertained a lot growing up. Um, and actually when I started, um, when I kind of moved off campus um, and lived in an apartment, I started uh, cooking when I was a student and having dinner parties and getting food magazines. And this was in the nineties and like, that wasn't really a common thing uh, for UGA students to do, I don't think so. Um, yeah, so it was. It wasn't like one moment necessarily, but it was. A, it was kind of a journey. But yeah, I guess there was one day where I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a shot. I'm gonna quit my job and cash in my 401k and see what happens. So luckily, uh, luckily it worked out for the most part. Or yeah, you know, it worked out. It worked out, and here yeah. you are with us this evening. Um, so tell us more about what's happening now. Didn't you just start a a, a new restaurant? Uh, it is literally days away from opening. Um, so Maypole is the newest concept. Um, we opened it in 2018 here in Athens, and it's a fast casual restaurant, um, really focused on um, vegetables and health, um, but not. we don't want to hit you over the head with, with the healthy aspect. Um, we want it to be delicious and convenient, a great price point. Um, so it's gone really well here in Athens. And so we are opening a second location in Atlanta. Um, like I said, literally any day now. We're just waiting on some final approvals. Uh, and we'll get going. We were training staff in Atlanta this morning, which was a lot of fun. Um, we're in the Summerhill neighborhood, which uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, if you remember Turner Stadium and the Olympic Stadium, um, we're just two blocks east of that on Georgia Avenue. Um, that stretch of Georgia Avenue has become a really um, hot new area with a lot of great restaurants. So we're excited to be a part of that. So uh, come see us if you're in the Atlanta area, um, probably sometime next week. So stay tuned or follow us on uh, social media. We will certainly do that. And I can promise you that a few of us will be making a trip to support you um, since you. we're all a part of this family together. Since you're here with us, we are part of the Young Alumni Council. How are you staying engaged with, with Georgia? Um, well, I'm now in my mid 40s, so I hope that I'm still considered a young <laughs> alum. I, I appreciate being part of this program. Um, so, I mean, living in Athens, I, I feel like I, I'm still very much a part of the university, which which certainly helps a lot. 
Um, but, um, you know, been involved with Grady. Uh, and then actually one of my favorite things is, um, is uh, mentoring and employing a lot of UGA students. And that's one of the reasons I like living in Athens uh, is because that age group, um, you know, people come to Athens to not only get an education, but figure out who they are, what they want to do with their lives. Uh, and so I've loved being, I had so many wonderful mentors at UGA. So I, I feel like I've been able to, to sort of, uh, in a small way, uh, mentor UGA students um, who've been working with us or interning mm -hmm. with us. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're you know, day, on a daily basis in, involved in what's happening around the university. So uh, it's awesome to live here. Um, and, you know, you, you stay really young and, uh, you know, up to date on TikTok and, you know, new music and, and things that I wouldn't otherwise uh, know about. So uh, it's pretty fun here. I bet. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and thank you for investing in students. Um, we, we really appreciate that. Are you ready to get cooking? Yeah, let's do this. Um, yeah, so I've got three dishes tonight. Um, so kind of a, a salad, an entree, and a dessert. Um, so the first dish um, is, is this salad. And this is a dish that was um, uh, shown to me by a good friend, Ra Randall Abney, who is a UGA alum as well. Um, he lived in Italy for many years and has um, started a business. Um, uh, here in town called Uncommon Gourmet, um, uncommongourmet.com. And so I'm going to give him a plug because his products are amazing. He imports olive oils and balsamic vinegars. Um, so I'm going to use his olive oil. Um, but his um, this salad he showed me, and, and really it's not even a recipe. I, I think I mentioned it. It's really just kind of a list of ingredients. So um, if I do anything out of order, um, it's just because um, the salad just kind of assemble it. So um, it's, it's, it's super easy and, and really forgiving, um, but delicious. Um, so I've got some greens here. These are all locally grown, but you can use um, you know, any variety of greens. The recipe that, that Randall taught me uh, is with arugula, um, which is um, uh, a beautiful, like uh, peppery, sometimes kind of spicy green, um, which I love using. We use it a lot over at the National, which is one of, one of my restaurants. Um, but this one, um, uh, one of the farms around uh, Athens had some little gem lettuces, which are these guys. Um, you might see it on restaurant menus, gem lettuces, maybe in, in your farmer's market or in your supermarket. Um, basically, it's a baby romaine. So romaine that you typically see in a Caesar salad. Um, these are just sort of baby heads of romaine. And um, we call them little gems. And I, I think they're really flavorful. Uh, and I just love they've got a nice crunch. But also, it's not kind of... Um, you know, so it's, it's big and unwieldy as a, as a head of romaine. So um, I'm just going to gather some of these lettuces, put them in this bowl. Um, I'm going to cut the, the base off. And actually, I'm just going to separate these leaves um, just because they're, they just fall apart um, in a really beautiful way. Um, and then when you get down to the core, you may need to trim this, the bottom off again, just separate it. Um, and this recipe makes four salads. Um, so this is a great starter, but you know, just modify this recipe if you're cooking for one or for two or for 10, um, you know, just scale up the ingredients. Um, and the other thing is this recipe is really, um, uh, it comes together right at the last minute. So this is about kind of getting all your prep um, done ahead of time. Um, so I've got my little gems, but use any a variety of lettuces that you have. Now this is one of my favorites and it looks kind of crazy. Um, this is uh, frise, which is part of the endive family. Um, it just looks like a it looks like a wig. Um, it's kind of nuts, um, but it's kind of just bound right here at the bottom uh, with this stem. So um, I'm gonna hold on to that for a moment. Um, typically, this is used a lot in France, and and typically you cut off most of the outer green. Um, and the outer green is what's exposed to the elements, and so it can be a little wilty. Sometimes I have a little brown spots. This one has got some of that. So I'm just gonna work my way around this head of frise and just trim a lot of that green off. Um, now, if this was um, in nicer shape um, and didn't have sort of the brown wilted spots, I would save that and saute it with, um, you know, and a little, uh, little butter and lemon juice would be really nice um, in accompaniment for chicken or fish. So um, we like using every bit of um, our ingredients and not letting much go to waste. Um, so uh, yeah, just gonna work my way around. And what you wind up with is the center of the head of frise. 
and it's this really pale, um, pale green, um, yellow uh, heart. So let me get some of this stuff out of the way. All right. Now we've maintained the bottom um, intact. And so at this point, I'm going to cut that off and then move it to my toss bowl. And the reason I use frisee, it's got a nice sort of bitter flavor, but it's really hearty. Um, when you add a vinaigrette, um, it stays crunchy. Um, this is a great uh, green for entertaining if you're having a dinner party because you can dress it ahead of time and it's not gonna wilt terribly. Um, the other thing I like about it is that it just, it expands a lot in volume. Uh, and then the other thing is it gives salad um, some nice volume and height. So if you had just, you know, maybe just the gem lettuces or just arugula, the salad might wind up being kind of flat. And I'm really into having big proportions and like big, um, uh, big uh, tall salads. Um, so the brise really does that for me. Um, so I'm going to add um, just kind of a pinch of salt. Um, the recipe says kosher salt. This is a sea salt. Um, with salt, I really like using a coarse salt, kosher sea salt, um, as opposed to an iodized salt, because it's got like a, a um, it's just easier to hold in your hand or in your, you know, container. If you had just really thin iodized salt, it'd be really easy to accidentally pour way too much salt um, into your, into your, uh, into your bowl. So big fan of, of kosher and of sea salt. So get those, those ugly bits away. Um, all right. So, um, got, I'm just going to, going to give this a toss, get the salt, um, evenly distributed. And then this recipe calls for, to makes four salads. I'm just going to demonstrate one right here. So I'm going to arrange um, our leaves here. And I love the volume, um, the height. Um, and, you know, lettuce is, is, is so light. So, you know, that looks like a lot. It's not going to be an overwhelming salad to eat. So, um, all right. So that's kind of the base. That's the foundation of our salad. Um, and the next part is going to be some grated pear. Um, so this is a Bartlett pear uh, found at the supermarket. It's um, uh, it's pretty ripe. Um, so I look for a ripe pear because you want it to be really juicy. And that's going to be an important part of this, this dish. Um, so this is just a, uh, you know, old school box grater, nothing fancy. Um, and I'm going to put it on this plate and I'm just going to grate it like so. And so I put two pears for this recipe. Um, you may not need both pears, um, but I've got, yes, really juicy and it smells amazing. I wish you could smell what's going on here. All right, so we've got the grated pear um, and I'm just gonna sprinkle that over the top of the salad. And so this is a salad that you would make right at the last minute because we don't want the pear to oxidize. Um, so if you're having a dinner party, um, this is something, you know, I'd have everything else kind of done in advance um, and have all this prepped in advance except for the grated pear. Um, now the way we can minimize the oxidation of the pear is to squeeze some lemon juice and then that's gonna give us some nice acid um, on the salad. Um, so with lemons, um, I don't want seeds in the salad. So what I do is I'll just cut down the sides. And actually the seeds all tend to be right in the middle, down in the core of the lemon. So I've got all these nice pieces of lemon, no seeds, super easy to work with. And then this middle has got all the seeds, but then I could just juice it later for another purpose. So. Um, Super handy, and this can be done in advance. So I'm gonna squeeze my lemon juice all over the salad, especially hitting the pear so that um, it can prevent some of the oxidation. And then I think in the recipe, I added olive oil early, in an earlier step. Um, there's really, yeah, there's not a lot. It doesn't really matter too much. So I'm gonna do it at this point. So I do wanna mention the olive oil that I'm using in this for this salad. This is called Oliva. This is um, one of the olive oils that Randall uh, imports 
uh, from Italy. Um, and it's just gorgeous. It's got this incredible golden color, this beautiful flavor, this nice pepperiness to it. It's going to contrast really well to the ingredients, um, to the sweet pear. Um, the other thing is, um, this is, uh, this olive oil is grown and produced. It's the most northern, most northern, um, olive oil in the world. Um, they're in Northern Italy. And just cause Italy is so far North compared to where we are. Um, it, it's really unique. Um, and it, it's just a beautiful olive oil. This is not an olive oil I would cook with. Um, um, I would save this for salads, for drizzling on vegetables, drizzling on a piece of fish, um, a finishing olive oil. And I'll talk a little bit more about an olive oil, a cooking olive oil in the next dish. But save this for special occasions because um, it's um, delicious. Um, and it doesn't have to be a special occasion. It can be dinner on Thursday night, but just when it's going to really be highlighted. Um, so what's going to tie all this together is some Asiago cheese. Uh, and this is a cow's milk cheese from Northern Italy. Um, if you don't have Asiago, you can use Parmesan, Pecorino, um, any sort of hard cheese, salty cheese. Um, but I, uh, I think the Asiago um, pairs beautifully. It almost uh, smells a little bit like a Swiss cheese. Um, so it's from Northern Italy, getting close to Austria and Switzerland. Um, and then my favorite tool, one of my favorite tools in the kitchen is a microplane, which um, you, you may have. These are now really common to find in, in cookware stores. Um, originally, it was a woodworking tool, um, but now you can you know, use it for all sorts of purposes. But my favorite is to grate cheese. Uh, I love cheese. I want it to look like it's snowed on top of the salad. Um, and so the microplane really helps with that. So I'm going to just grate lots of cheese over the top. Um, and honestly, like in Italy, they don't put as much cheese as I, as I do. So apologies. but. Um, I think it just uh, looks beautiful. Um, it's delicious. And then also because this is a, the microplane, the cheese is really fine. So it looks like a lot, but it's not, it's not, as, not as much as you think. Um, so that's, a, oh, there's also a little black pepper if you want. Um, and then I might do just a little drizzle of olive oil on top of that as well. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is a salad that if you're making it for a group, make it at the last minute so the pear doesn't oxidize. But also, this is just the simplest salad in the world. So, you know, if, if it's just, you know, a weeknight and you want to whip something up, um, it's really light. It's refreshing. It's a great way to start a meal. Um, you know, and you could even have, you know, some sliced chicken, um, a piece of salmon next to that. Um, and I think it would be a really nice meal. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is local lettuces with Asiago cheese and grated pear. Uh, along with this beautiful olive oil. Um, so uh, yeah, um, if you're cooking along, um, uh, I hope that you enjoy it. And then if you're um, following along, I hope that you'll give it a shot. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to, to Marini, who's gonna tell us um, some more about Campus Kitchen. Thank you so much for that, Peter. That looked amazing. And I certainly, certainly wish I was there to eat it. Um, thank you so much. So since Peter has shared our first dish, we're going to move to our next portion of the event and talk with a representative from Campus Kitchen. Uh, Kelson McConnell is the president. Hi, Kelson. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, before we ask you a few questions, let's watch a quick video to give folks some general knowledge about Campus Kitchen at UGA. Because I'm going to this university, I'm a lot better off than a lot of people. So it's, you know, my responsibility to help give back. I would probably say the first time I went on a delivery shift is what really sucked me into Campus Kitchen. I immediately really fell in love with the work I was doing. The Campus Kitchen at the University of Georgia is a student organization that runs a little bit like a nonprofit. We donate pre-made meals and grocery bags to 51 different families in need in the Athens area. We have people that harvest from U Garden, pick up food from Trader Joe's. We've recovered 60,000 pounds of food that was just going to be thrown out otherwise, that we then turned into 12,000 meals. A lot of the families, they are on the waiting list for other programs. The waiting list is just so long for people who need food. 
So that's where Canvas Kitchen steps in. Realizing that you know an hour of my time a week can make that much of a difference is, is a really strong thing to take away. Giving that extra meal and grocery bag a week helps people to get over the line to just you know make it. The biggest component about Campus Kitchen is helping the seniors in the Athens area. The second biggest is teaching students and students learning about service and learning about nonprofit work and nutrition and it being an experience that they can take forward in life. Thank you so much for that great video. I mean, I can see that you and your team truly do have a, a heart for service. So thank you for all the work that, that you do. Uh, tell us how and why you got involved with the Campus Kitchen. Yeah, so uh, as long as I can remember, one of my biggest sort of pet peeves has just been, you know, seeing restaurants and grocery stores throw out a lot of the excess food they have that is still perfectly good to eat. And so when I came to the University of Georgia, I wanted to see if there was a organization uh, in Athens or on campus that addressed those issues of food insecurity and food waste. And when I looked and did some searching, I found the Campus Kitchen. And as soon as I found out, I immediately got involved. And I've been involved for over three years now. And it's been a great time working with Campus Kitchen. That's that's awesome. And thank you there. Thank you for sharing that. And since you've been involved for three years, I'm sure you've seen um, the great work that you all have put in place come to life. Can you talk about the impact you're making? For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, our most immediate impact uh, is definitely the clients that we serve on a weekly basis. We run uh, almost all year round, except for a couple of uh, breaks throughout the year because we're primarily student run organization. All of our volunteers are UGA students. And so we run spring, summer and fall. And so we get, you know, to help dozens of families in the Athens Clark County area that need a help in just securing meals and food and helping other nonprofits in the area as well. But another impact that's really great is working with students at UGA and giving them a chance to really involve themselves within the community and see the greater Athens area and not just, for, you know, and to expand outside of the UGA sort of campus. Got it. Thank you for that. I'm very happy to hear that, you know, living in Atlanta, we don't see a lot of that happening in Athens. I'm glad we have this event to share that story. And I'm sure that the work has been impacted by the pandemic. Can you talk about how COVID has impacted the work? Definitely. Uh, before COVID, we were uh, we had our, one of our headquarters. We mainly cooked and stored a lot of our food at Talmadge Terrace off of Beechwood and the reti retirement living community. And so with COVID, we had to move out of there for just mm -hmm. for safety. Um, and we moved out to U Garden, which has been a community partner of ours for years. And mm -hmm. so we stationed out there and because students weren't allowed to work on campus, our team was drastically reduced in size. And at, you know, at points it was just three of us working um, with over the summer. Uh, and I, cause it was just uh, my program coordinator and AmeriCorps Vista and then me as well. And we were just working, making sure everyone was still getting the food they needed on a weekly basis. And we just, with other organizations uh, from the community, we came in together and really helped step up so that we could help the community in the times of need. But thank you again for stepping up and working through that challenge um, that COVID has presented for a lot of us and those in need. Can you, final question, how does the UGA garden fit into this work? Yeah, and like I previously mentioned, we now, uh, we, our headquarters are moved out there. And so, They've been partnering with us and what they, a lot of the produce, the majority of it that they grow there actually goes to us for us to cook into our meals along with the food that we recover mm -hmm. from like the video said, Trader Joe's and other local venues. And so they, one, they get to teach students how to you know do organic agriculture, but also the fruit of their labor goes right back into the community through us. And so it's a really nice uh, collaboration that we have with them. And just even with the pandemic that I think that our, connection has grown even stronger. Awesome. Thank you for that. And thank you for being a part of our event tonight. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me.
So now I'm going to toss it back over to Peter for our next dish. Thanks so much. Um, so this next dish is called gamba salahio. It's kind of an exotic name, but um, it just means shrimp with garlic. Um, it's a classic Spanish dish. Um, you'll see it in Spanish uh, tapas bars. Uh, and so we do it all the time at the National. Um, I do it a lot at home. Um, and so we're actually doing it as an entree tonight. Um, this would be really great. I've got it with bread tonight, but it would be really great um, over grits, over polenta, make it a bit more of a substantial meal. Um, but I, um, I think it's awesome with shrimp, which is the classic. Uh, it's equally good with mushrooms if you're a mushroom fan, especially in the summer if you have access to chanterelle mushrooms, um, the wild mushrooms that, that often grow around here. Uh, and then if you really want to get over the top, um, shrimp and mushrooms is, is awesome. So. Um, I've got this beautiful um, parsley, believe it or not. This is parsley. Um, it's from Woodland Gardens uh, Farm um, just outside Athens that uh, we buy a lot from. And a lot of restaurants in Atlanta that you may go to uh, also um, buy from farms around Athens, including Woodland Gardens. Um, so this is some gorgeous parsley. This is a flat leaf Italian parsley. Um, if you've got curly parsley, kind of the more traditional parsley, um, that's fine too. I think parsley gets a bad rap. Uh, it is actually delicious. It's got great flavor. Um, if you just eat a leaf, um, you know, it's, it's just this, this herbaceous, um, you know, kind of unique parsley flavor um, that I think people should use more often. So I wanted to just kind of talk about parsley for a second. Um, the other thing with parsley and cilantro is that the stems are really delicious and flavorful too. So especially with this gorgeous parsley, it would be a shame not to use all these stems. Um, so um, if you're if you're following along at home, uh, you don't want to pick all the parsley leaves off. Um, just chop up the stems as well, um, and especially if you're using cilantro, I love cilantro stems. So um, don't don't throw out those stems and mess out on that flavor. Uh, now I will say that the um, we're cooking this dish, so the stems will kind of cook down. They can be kind of crunchy, which in a lot of dishes is something that you want, but. Um, uh, you can also save the stems for a stock, for a soup, um, and, uh, but yeah, it'd be a shame to lose all that flavor. Um, so I'm going to bounce around a little bit, um, and I'm going to start with this parsley. Um, I just kind of pick some leaves off. So I've got some stems here. Um, the way I like to chop herbs is just to gather them and kind of even kind of roll them if you can, kind of like into a little cigar. Um, and then. Um, you know, one trick, um, and I'm not sure how, how well this will come across um, on camera, but um, there is a risk when you're chopping things that you're going to cut the top of your finger off. Um, and that's obviously something we want to avoid. So um, when you're chopping, try to tuck your the tip of your finger kind of down behind um, your knuckles. Um, and that'll give you a better chance of not nicking the end of your uh, finger off. Um, so the other thing is, you know, I can't say enough about having a sharp knife. Um, that really makes all the difference. Um, you know, it's an old saying, but more cuts happen from dull knives than from sharp knives. So, um, so I usually, you know, do my shopping and then I come back over a few times. Um, and because we actually like the parsley flavor, we don't want the parsley to just disappear completely in this dish. I'm leaving kind of bigger pieces. So I'm going to add that to some parsley I already have. Um, now, the real star of this dish is the garlic, so um, I hope you love garlic. Uh, we, we love garlic, and, and there's some beautiful farms around Athens that grow the garlic. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just going to kind of break, break it apart. I've got some already sliced, but wanted to give you an idea of what I'm doing here. Um, I don't want to smash it, and I'll, I'll show you that when we're cooking it, um, the reason for that. But I want to just thinly slice it, so um, kind of taking most of the peel off going to cut that sort of dry end off uh, and that gives me a good opening to be able to um, get the rest of the peel off. Now if you're really frustrated with getting those last little bits of the garlic peel, I'm just give it a really light tap with the side of your knife um, and that will probably help create like a fissure which then you can get in there and, and peel the rest off. But again I don't want to use like a garlic press and I don't want to smash it because um, I actually want to thinly slice the garlic. So let me wipe off some of this parsley. All right, so my garlic clove, um, I just want to thinly slice um, 
And then if you've got like a really large clove, um, imagine this twice the size, you can cut it in half and then continue slicing, but you want uh, kind of bigger pieces. All right, so I'm gonna add that to my garlic. All right, so um, the other things I've got here is chili flake. Uh, and this is, you know, traditional chili flake. Um, you know, that's, it's similar to what you'd see at a pizza parlor that you could sprinkle on your pizza. Um, this dish, like Spanish food typically isn't spicy, um, but this adds some nice background heat. If you love spicy food, add a lot of this. That's, you know, it's totally up to you. If you can't handle any spice at all, leave it out, no problem. Um, I got um, some beautiful shrimp. Um, this is a pound and a half of shrimp. And uh, if you can, I really recommend um, buying American shrimp if you have access to it. Um, it, it just wild American shrimp just can't be beat. Um, and uh, in, in it's sustainable. Um, it supports um, uh, local fishermen, um, shrimp, shrimp boat. Um, and uh, yeah, and it just has so much more flavor than in a farm raised imported shrimp. So if you have access to American shrimp and especially Georgia shrimp, if you have access, um, it's just, uh, it can't be deep. I've got some more of my lemon that I cut off. Um, we'll get to that towards the end. Um, and then lastly, I've got some beautiful bread that we got at Independent, which is a great bakery in Five Points here in Athens. Um, if they weren't open when you were in school, you really missed out. And I hope that you'll come visit Athens and check out Independent. Um, they do a beautiful job. Um, their pastries are amazing. That's kind of our weekend cheat is to go get pastries. And uh, but their bread is incredible. And this is a Levain, um, and it's a day old bread. So um, for this application for toasting bread for making croutons, um, day old really works better um, than a fresh loaf. So buy a loaf, you know, eat a few slices the day of when it's super fresh, and then save it and use it for other things uh, in the coming days. Um, you can also freeze it and thaw it out and it makes great toast or croutons. So um, I'm sure you've got great bakeries near you. Um, so support your local bakery and, and buy some great bread. Um, so we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so now I'm gonna transition over here to the stove. Um, and so I mentioned um, olive oil. Um, I've got a perfectly reasonable olive oil. Um, this is a Chilean olive oil that is um, uh, produced from Spanish olive, the Spanish variety of olive. Um, and it's it's a totally fine olive oil, but it's not the oliva. Um, you know, this is an olive oil that I don't feel bad cooking with. And what happens when you cook olive oil is that you lose a lot of the really interesting nuanced flavors um, that you get from a really special olive oil. So um, also the... Um, the, the health benefits that you get from olive oil um, tend to dissipate when you cook it. So, um, so yeah, so I've got a half cup of olive oil. I've got this nice big cast iron pan, but any um, big pan will work. And notice that I haven't turned it on yet. That's important. Um, so nothing's happening in the pan yet. Half, half cup of olive oil. Then this is six garlic cloves thinly sliced. So this is, you know, that's a quite a bit all, uh, quite a bit of garlic, um, but that's all right. Um, and then I'm gonna do a pinch of chili flake, hey, a little bit more than a pinch. Um, and so now I'm gonna turn the burner on. I'm just gonna check that burner, yep. And I'm kinda gonna do it sort of over, um, sort of medium low heat. Um, and it's gonna give this a little stir. I'm gonna let it hang out for a minute. The reason uh, we started it, um, well, when we sliced it, and the reason we're starting it in cold oil is that we want the, we're really creating a, um, we're infusing the flavors of the garlic and the chili into the olive oil. Uh, if we put smashed garlic into really hot oil, it would cook super fast and you'd risk burning the garlic. Um, and, and then you'd have sort of ruined garlic and olive oil. Your olive oil would taste like burned garlic. So um, yeah, that's gonna sort of hang out um, for just a little while um, and it's gonna start smelling really amazing. Um, the, you know, the delicious olive oil, the garlic, the chili flake. Um, so that's gonna be really nice. Um, the other thing sort of similar to the salad is that this dish, we wanna have everything ready to go because it's easy, this dish is easy but it happens real fast. And if you don't have all your um, 
mise en place, which is um, a, um, a chef term for all your all the components of your dish. If you don't have your mise en place ready to go, um, you're likely to miss the the moment when you needed to add something. So um, have everything ready. And I don't know if you can tell through the through the camera, but we're starting to get some bubbles. Um, so the garlic starting to bubble, and the aroma is um, the perfume of the, of the garlic um, is really nice. Um, so that's really happy. Um, and um, oh, while that's kind of coming together, um, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about sherry. So um, we use a lot of sherry at the National. Sherry is a fortified wine from the south of Spain. Um, and this is an Amontillado sherry, the variety of sherry. There's lots of different sherries. There are lots of different price points. You get a really inexpensive one um, at your package store, grocery store, and you can get you know, very fine, expensive sherries. Um, I'm going to be honest, this bottle of Amontillado sherry I bought, I buy at Trader Joe's. I think seven bucks for 750 milliliters. The great thing about sherry is it doesn't go bad the way, you know, an open bottle of regular wine would. So you can keep it. But I think that if you give this dish a try with shrimp or mushrooms, um, I think you'll want to have a bottle around for your cooking. Um, and the Amontillado variety, it's got a nice um, nutty characteristic. It's got a kind of light brown color. Um, so um, I'm a big, uh, big fan. Um, in this recipe, we're going to use a quarter cup. So I'm going to go ahead and measure mine out. Um, so that I have it ready. I'm going to set it right here. Um, yeah, it smells amazing. I mean, this um, sherry would be delicious um, with some ice, maybe a little orange wedge. We'll top it off with a little soda. It would be a really great low alcohol, refreshing uh, start to the meal. Would be great to be drinking this while making this dinner. Um, I always think it's nice to, to have a beverage while you're cooking. Um, all right, so... Um, the garlic is in, is really nice right now. I'm starting to get some um, golden color. Um, and so actually I'm gonna go ahead and add uh, my shrimp. And this shrimp, um, you know, is, was chilled. Um, and so we're rapidly dropping the temperature of the pan. And so by having the shrimp ready to go, as soon as the garlic turned brown, um, I can kind of um, basically sort of stop the cooking process, prevent the garlic from getting, from getting too dark. Um, and I'm going to let it hang out here for about a minute or so. And I'm going to try to get, um, the shrimp, move them around so that they're all kind of touching the surface of the pan as best we can. Um, I'm not going to move it around just yet. I want the shrimp that are touching the bottom of the pan to get a little bit of color, um, to start to, uh, turn pink. Um, so yeah, I'll give it a few more seconds, um, and then we're going to add um, our sherry. Now, this is a gas, uh, a gas burner, so um, if you're cooking on gas, I would really recommend um, turning the gas off before you add the sherry. Um, you know, uh, you might have a, a flame, um, you know, kind of create a banana's foster moment with, with flames uh, in your pan, which there's actually nothing really wrong with that. I don't think your house will burn down, but... Um, it may be an unwelcome surprise. So um, I can, this smells incredible. Garlic, chili flake, we're starting to get the shrimp aromas and you kind of tell like we're starting to get a little bit of color. Um, so yeah. So in just a second, I'm gonna start kind of giving this a stir. So yeah, why don't we go ahead. You can kind of see the shrimp. Um, you know, they're a little bit, when they're raw, they're almost sort of translucent. Um, so the one, the ones that were touching the bottom of the pan are getting a little opaque. That pink color is coming out. Oops, I lost one. That's all right. All right. So now I'm going to turn off the heat, turn off the flame. If you're cooking on electric, you don't have to worry about this. And so now I'm going to add the sherry. And then I'll kind of give it a stir just to help cook out a little bit of the olive oil. I'm sorry, cook out a little bit of the alcohol. Um, and then I'm going to turn the, ga the heat back on, turn the gas back on. So this dish, um, I really want it to be very saucy because um, I love to sop up sauce with bread or with grits or polenta or a biscuit, if that's what you have around. Um, this sauce is going to be really delicious. 
Um, so um, give it a stir. Um, I would also kind of shake the pan. Um, and by shaking the pan, what we do is we create almost an emulsion between the olive oil, the sherry, and the juices that are coming off the shrimp. Um, and, and, and it kind of thickens the sauce a bit, which, um, which is nice. This is going to happen really fast. Um, so I would have the table set. Uh, if, if you've got other family members, tell them to get off their Zoom and come to the dinner table because this will happen real quick and you want to eat this when it's hot. All right, so we're getting really close. I've got just a little bit of uh, translucent uh, shrimp hanging out. Now, the other thing that I'll do at this point is I'm going to give the, the sauce a little taste. Take off and needs a pinch of salt. Um, and at the very end, we're going to add um, a little lemon juice. All right, so you're going to add a bit of salt to that. I think we're just about ready. Now, at the very end, I'm going to take it off heat. I'm going to add um, our parsley. This may be more than two tablespoons, more than the recipe said. Um, two tablespoons is great. I'm a big fan of parsley, so I'm adding a bit more. All right, and then last is, uh, you know, seafood always needs a little bit of lemon. So I've got my lemon slices. And I'm gonna give that um, a generous amount of lemon. Because we've got, you know, the olive oil um, and the shrimp are gonna be rich. Uh, the olive oil adds some fat. So I always think you need a little bit of acid to help balance everything going on. So, um, I feel like that looks pretty good. Now, if you, you could do this as an appetizer and if you've got, you know, if you're, you know, just um, serving a couple folks, you can just serve your, at your table like this, you know, put down um, a trivet and, and put this pan on the table and let everyone kind of snack, dip bread in there um, uh, and treat it like a, a kind of a community appetizer, um, really sort of like a tapa. So, but we're gonna plate it. So I've got a bowl here. Um, I took some of the bread from Independent, um, this nice Levain. Um, I put a lot of olive oil on it, toasted it. Um, so I'm going to use that as my base. Um, you could also just sort of serve it on the side, but um, I love how the bread soaks up um, this delicious sauce. So I'm going to just spoon the shrimp right on top. And then the nice thing is that the juices, the sauce is going to soften the bread a bit. So sort of, you know, you eat the shrimp and then at the end, the bread is going to be really um, kind of soft and, and um, it's going to have soft up all this sauce. Um, so I'm going to tilt the pan a little bit so I can get a bit more. Um, yeah, there we go. I'll do one more spoon just to just to be extra generous. All right, so always get a little on the side. Yeah, so um, this is gambas al ajillo. Like I said, um, it would be great over grits, polenta. Um, I personally like it with the bread. Um, and then if you want to serve the bread on the side, you could definitely do that and then kind of just sop in that pan. So um, gambas al ajillo, um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you give it a try. Um, and especially when George shrimp come in this summer, um, this is a great, great dish to use Georgia shrimp with. So uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jasmine, who's gonna tell us um, a bit more about, um, about the uh, community kitchen. Hi everyone. So my name is Jasmine Severino Hernandez and I am the vice president of the Young Alumni Leadership Council. And I have volunteered with Campus Kitchen before and I'm just gonna share a little bit about my experience it's a great organization based out of Athens. So one of the other girls on the council and I volunteered. We drove to Athens that morning and we spent the entire day with Campus Kitchen. So the first thing we did was go to Trader Joe's and we collected all of the food that they donate to Campus Kitchen. There we put everything in our cars in kind of an order that we knew, okay, this is the produce, this is um, the meat, et cetera. 
and then we drove to the actual location of Campus Kitchen. I know that location has changed, but we drove there and unpacked the car and we had a lot of food to unpack. And later we sorted it out there. So we would put the stuff that maybe was old to the side and then sorted the meats on one side, the fruits in the other. And then based on the menu for the night, we would take out those items and then anything that needed to be refrigerated, we would put away. And then my favorite part was later in the day when we got together after lunchtime and we cooked all the food together. So we prepped it with the students that volunteer with Campus Kitchen and we made different meals that were set for that night. And then we boxed everything up and those meals were delivered to the people that needed that food. Um, one of my favorite things about Campus Kitchen is really the impact that it makes. They work so hard to get all these donations and then put these meals together and they're able to feed over, I think it's about 700 meals a month. And that's insane for people that actually need the food who are waiting for it. And it's a great service to the community, but it also helps those UGA students give back and learn a little bit more about the local community in Athens. So I hope that each of you is really inspired to helping with Campus Kitchen. I think it's a great organization. And if you have the time to volunteer, it's a great way to give back. My favorite part is the cooking aspect. So if you like that part, I definitely recommend that you sign up and work with these students and learn a little bit about cooking as you go along. And I know that you're probably wondering, so how can I volunteer? They make it really easy. If you go to their website, you can click the volunteer option under take action on the menu. And from there, you can sign up as an individual or group. So if you have a few friends that are ready to volunteer with you, I definitely recommend doing it as a group, especially once it's safe to do so. But if not, you can do it individually. And if you have any questions about volunteering or about Campus Kitchen in general, you can ask us by using the contact us section of the website. And you can also add your questions to the chat. So now we will move into an interview about Campus Kitchen with Andy. Hey, uh, my name is Andy Bashelia and I'm the program coordinator of Campus Kitchen. Um, and that means that I run kind of all the behind the scenes um, part of Campus Kitchen and work alongside all the UGA students who are uh, volunteering with us, as well as interning like Kelton, who you met earlier tonight. Um, so kind of the behind the scenes picture, just like Jasmine was talking about, I am in charge of kind of figuring out where all of our donations are coming in each week and then where the food is going out into the community. Um, so currently we're serving about 50 families every week, about 300 people, and those are all senior led families. So they're grandparents who are raising grandchildren in our community. Um, and as well as we donate um, extra produce to a bunch of different local nonprofits in Athens that are also running food pantries or um, serving people who are in need. And during COVID, as you can imagine, the need in the community has dramatically increased and the entire landscape of hunger relief has changed. So we had to get really creative um, in order to keep operating. And we were one of two campus kitchen programs uh, nationwide that kept operating all throughout COVID. So campus kitchen used to be a national program. Um, that national kind of brand has disbanded, but there's still a bunch of campus kitchens all over the country. And um, ours at UGA was able to, to keep running throughout COVID um, thanks to our partnership with UGarden. Um, so some of you are probably wondering what the food trailer is all about. Um, so currently we are, um, we were able to work with some community partners. Um, one of those is the um, Covenant Presbyterian Church here in Athens. And that's how we kind of hatched the idea for the, the trailer. Um, so, um, Maroni, you're, you're back. Sure. You I am. Thank you so much for, for talking about the food trailer. Sure. I know it's going to be, it's going to help a, a, a lot of people. Can you tell us about the grant and where that stands right now? Sure. Um, 
So we worked with a local uh, food truck builder here in Athens, and they gave us a quote for 43,000 for the total cost of the trailer. Mm -hmm. And um, we received through the Parent Leadership Council about $38,000 of that 43. Um, so we have about $5,000 to go for the full amount. Well, we're excited to do our, our part to help. Can you talk about uh, personally about what this means to you and why you're so passionate about this work? Sure. Yeah. Um, I've always been involved in food work ever since I was an undergraduate student. I didn't go to UGA for my undergrad, but um, came here for my graduate school, um, graduate degree. And um, I studied sustainable food systems. And mm -hmm. it's just always been a part of um, ever since I was growing up. My mom went to culinary school and was a pastry chef. And so food has always been an important part of my life. Um, and I have also mm -hmm. have family members who are farmers. So kind of that full full circle picture of food has always been um, something I've been passionate about and serving serving the community and uh, social justice work has also been a big part of my interest. So the food trailer um, will enable us to run a um, mobile free, free breakfast program in the community. Um, during COVID, schools have been shut down here in Athens up until very recently. And a lot of students, uh, K-12 students in the community rely on free breakfast um, every day as well as lunch. And one of our community partners, um, Travis Williams, was noticing that even though the, um, the free breakfast program was still running in Athens, there was trouble getting it on time to the kids who need it. So some students wouldn't be getting their free breakfast until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Um, and so that's kind of where the idea of the food trailer project um, came to life. And eggs and bread are two things that we get in large quantities donated from Trader Joe's. Um, and so we thought, well, we have all these ingredients. If we could get a mobile kitchen, we would be able to um, help with that uh, need in the community. Thank you so much. I, and I, I can speak for the council when I say that we really are excited to have this be a part of tonight's event. So thank you for being a part of our discussion and telling us more about how we can get involved. And I know that you'll, I'm, I, I'm hoping that you'll see a lot of the, uh, the people who are at tonight's event be a part of it at some point. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you for having us. Peter, we're ready for that last dish. Well, thanks so much. Uh, and the work that Campus Kitchen does is really inspiring. So uh, I'm so glad that the larger uh, UGA community is getting to learn about what they do, uh, which is so impactful here in Athens. Um, so we've now on the third dish, which is dessert. And uh, I have a sweet tooth. And so dessert is always my favorite. Um, and um, yeah, I'm excited to share this with you. So um, in 2014, my brother and I opened Condor Chocolates, and it's really my brother's the chocolate maker. Um, but we kind of, this idea was hatched um, several years before that. Uh, our mom's from Ecuador, uh, and Ecuador is um, Spanish for equator. It's right on the equator, uh, and it's a, a really cool place. There's Galapagos Islands, there's tropical rainforests, there's Andes Mountains, uh, and um, produces, um, really delicious seafood and tropical fruit. And then some things that we use here at our business are um, coffee. We are roasting our own coffee. Uh, and then of course, cacao, which is the raw, um, which is the fruit, the raw ingredient for uh, chocolate. So um, if you're in Athens, um, we'd love to show you how um, chocolate is made. Um, and we call that process bean to bar, meaning that we're involved in the entire process from bean. So we go to Ecuador, source the beans, meet the farmers, uh, and then the whole process, the, the, the beans get shipped to the Port of Savannah and they come to Athens and then we take over uh, and create a finished product. So um, so tonight what I'm making is a chocolate budino. Uh, this is kind of similar to a chocolate pudding, although it's like a little, it's more decadent. Um, it's pretty rich. Uh, and so the portions on this are small, but if you want a big portion, um, absolutely no shame in that. And, and you know, um, uh, I, I recommend it. Um, so, um, but it, but this is a uh, Italian. Chocolate's a bit too much for you. Um, you could use a milk chocolate. Um, you may want to, um, pull back on the sugar a little bit. Um, so, but it's actually, um, 
in this bowl, I've got eight ounces of chocolate and I've got a mixture here. I've, cause I wanted to show you, you can use different chocolates. Um, so these are bits of chocolate bar, 72% um, chocolate bar that I've chopped up. Um, and then also I've got chocolate chips here. Um, so if you have um, dark chocolate chips, you could use as well and that, that works well. So I've got both um, eight ounces, it'll, it'll, both will work um, just fine. Um, so really the beginning of this process is to make a custard. Um, so I'm going to gather a couple things. Um, I've got um, some beautiful fresh eggs. Um, I've got um, five egg yolks um, in this bowl. Um, and then I've got two cups of um, heavy cream. Um, and then a third a cup of granulated sugar. So I'm going to start with um, the eggs and the sugar. I'm going to come over here. Um, I've got sort of a medium size uh pot here. I'm going to add my um, egg yolks. And, um, you know, with egg yolks, I always, when I'm cracking them, get a little bit of shell. So I typically use um, sometimes up to three bowls when I'm, when I need um, uh, like egg Sorry, yolks, for example. Um, and so I've got, um, so I'll like crack on one, uh, add the yolk um, to the bowl. Um, and then um, if I have any uh, uh, shell, I'll remove it and then I'll pour it into my bowl um, where I'm collecting sort of my good egg yolks. Um, and then I'll have a third bowl where I put the shells um, that I want to discard. So, um, all right, so uh, five egg yolks right there, um, third of a cup of sugar, um, and I'm gonna turn this in. I'm gonna grab a whisk and I'm gonna start giving it a stir. I'm going to mix this really well. I okay, want to do this before this gets too hot. So I'm just going to mix the sugar and the egg yolk really well. And then one thing also is that this um, can be made in advance. It can made, be made a couple days in advance. So if you are um, wanting to pin ahead, um, um, this is a great dessert to serve when you're entertaining because it can just be hanging out in the fridge. Um, uh, until right before you want to eat it. All right, so I've got this um, nicely combined, and then I've got two cups of heavy cream, and then I actually love these um, measuring cups that have the spout uh, because what I want to do is um, I'm going to have this kind of on low heat, um, and I want to just very slowly um, combine or just pour in the cream into this egg yolk. Um, and sugar mixture. All right, so just little by little. And so this is going to be the process for making custard. So if you're making some brulee, if you're making an ice cream, um, this is the same process. And just continue whisking because if you were to walk away, these egg yolks might start to scramble, um, which would give you um, sugary scrambled eggs, which um, you probably don't want. And then once you've kind of more than halfway done, you can start pouring kind of in a, a steadier stream. And this will give your hand a good workout as you keep stirring. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue stirring um, until we get a uh, nice, um, we want it to get kind of nice and thick, and that'll happen after a little while. Um, there's kind of a spoon test where you put the spoon in, and on the back of the spoon, you run a finger, uh, and if the, if the, if where your finger was, um, if, if, the, if you can still see the, the streak on the back of the spoon, um, that means um, you're in pretty good shape. So we're getting pretty close. I am going to step away for a second, um, which is fine. I just walk away for just a second. Um, I want to show you the kind of the next step and go ahead and have that ready. Um, I've got another container that's heat proof, and I'm going to add my eight ounces of chocolate right in the bottom. And then I've got, um, I've got this really handy little uh, small strainer 
but sort of any any kind of sieve or strainer, just set that right on top. And then we're gonna go back to this in a second. So um, I'm gonna come back here to my custard and kind of check it. Yeah, we're getting kind of close. Um, let's see if you can kind of tell. Um, we're almost there. I'm gonna give it just a second longer um, to come together. Now, there's one ingredient um, that's optional um, that we'll add towards the end, uh, but that is um, uh, some alcohol, which um, I'm actually using um, some American Spirit Whiskey um, that is made by two UJ alums, um, Jim Chastain, who I went to high school with, um, and Charlie Thompson, who's a tour guide with us um, at the Visitor Center. So um, if you're not familiar with um, their whiskeys, uh, they're delicious. They have a tasting room uh, in Atlanta. So I really recommend that. Um, but you use any sort of whiskey, bourbon, um, rum would be really nice as well, um, like a, uh, a dark rum. All right, so I'm gonna check this custard again. Yeah, so you can see how like my finger mark is staying in place. It's not sort of all running you know, the, the custard is, is now thick enough that it's not all running together. Um, so that's that's what we're looking for. Um, so I'm going to now move it over. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm right-handed. So um, I'm going to just gently pour this through the sieve. And the reason I'm using the sieve is because towards the bottom, um, almost always going to have some bits of egg that cooked a little bit more than we wanted um, and creating sort of scrambled eggs um, that we don't want to have in the budina because the budina we want it to be really rich and silky uh, and smooth. So um, now I can kind of let that continue to strain while I move my pot. I'm going to take my spoon and just sort of press the remaining um, egg mixture. So like this mixture right here is basically a custard. You could um, put that into, you could add maybe some vanilla bean and put that into dishes. And that would be sort of the basis for like a creme brulee if you wanted to go in that direction. But um, we're doing chocolate tonight. So um, what's gonna happen is this warm custard mixture is going to melt the chocolate. And it looks like a little broken right now, but just keep at it using your wrist. It'd be kind of vigorous. And like pretty quickly, you've got this really delicious chocolate mixture. It's pretty hot right now. Um, and now um, we're gonna add um, a, uh, two, a little bit of butter. I've got some, un uh, some uh, two teaspoons of butter. I've got my um, American Spirit Whiskey, um, and then I'm gonna also add um, two pinches of salt. The salt's optional, but I think, it, I think, it's, I think it's nice. Um, I love um, sweet, salty, that combination. So I'm gonna give it another good whisking, get that mixture, that butter is melted. And also make sure the salt and the, uh, the whiskey are fully incorporated. All right, I think it's looking pretty good. All right, so at this point, um, you could, I mean, you could eat it right out of the bowl. It would just be this warm pudding. It, it would taste delicious, but we're, we're going for a cold, creamy texture. Um, so um, I've put it in, um, I've put it in martini glasses before. Um, I've got these really cool little water cups. Um, the recipe says uh, the portions are four ounces, which is half a cup. Um, which I think is, is kind of all you need, um, especially after a big meal. Um, and this is pretty rich. So luckily this ladle is two ounces. So basically two ladles full will be my portion. You could put this in any vessel. Um, you could put it sort of um, in one big container. Um, I think it's really kind of elegant to serve um, in a beautiful glass, um, whether it's in a stem or not. And it is We'll see how I do. I almost never um, 
get it where I, where I don't get some on the sides of the glass. So we'll see how I do when, I'm, when I have a lot of pressure on me. Um, so far, so good. Now, um, this is delicious on its own, but I um, love to garnish it. Um, and so after about 30 minutes, you can um, sort of set it aside until it cools off a bit and then put it in the refrigerator for at least 30 minutes. Um, and then you'll have that nice, cold, um, creamy consistency. Um, now, um, I would give it a tap. Um, there may be some air bubbles in there. So give it a tap just to release the air bubbles. And then put this in the refrigerator. Now, I mentioned garnishes. Um, of course, eat it like that. It would be delicious, but um, optional. And I think on the recipe, there's lots of ideas. Um, this is rich. And so I actually um, sometimes put just a little bit of sour cream, which sounds unusual um, in a dessert, but it's got a tanginess that's going to balance the richness of the budina. Um, also, when I'm cooking, I love to have different contrasts. So whether it's flavor, color, shape, um, and in this instance, texture, um, a textural contrast is, is going to be really key because um, you're eating this really cool, creamy consistency. I love to have like a little bit of crunch. So um, we have cocoa nibs, which are kind of toasted um, meat of the cacao bean. Um, that would be a really nice garnish. Um, at the holidays, especially if there's kids around, I love to do like a little whipped cream and some chopped peppermints on top would be really nice. Um, nuts, of course. Um, and also in the summertime, like a little whipped cream and fresh berries um, would be great as well. So, um, you know, you can really be creative um, and uh, go in any direction. Um, because of the egg in here, you know, I just um, keep it in the fridge for a couple days. Um, so again, this is wonderful for entertaining. Um, get it done a day in advance, two days in advance. Um, and if you're going to serve it, um, for an event and you've made it ahead of time, I would take it out of the refrigerator about 30, 45 minutes before, um, just so it's not ice cold. Um, and also the texture will kind of soften up a touch. Um, right out of the fridge, ice cold, it can be a little firm. So I would um, you know, make sure it, it kind of warms up a touch. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, a, that's dessert. So we've had a salad um, with uh, local lettuces and pear and Asiago cheese. We had a shrimp entree, um, which would also be great as an appetizer. Um, but tonight we made it as an entree um, with lots of garlic and chili and then sherry. Um, and then we're going to finish off with some chocolate budino. Um, so um, in about 30 minutes, um, we're going to eat these um, and reward ourselves. So um, I hope you've enjoyed the recipes. Hope you'll give them a try. Um, also, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm at... Uh, uh, on Instagram, Facebook, um, shoot me a message. I love to talk to, to folks about um, anything at all. But, um, you know, if you've got recipes or, or questions about restaurants, um, absolutely hit me up. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over and uh, I think we're going to have a little um, Q&A. Um, so appreciate you joining us. Um, Peter, thank you so much for um, that delicious meal. I really am looking forward to trying it later on. Um, but we were sharing with you some information about our events coming up. So if you're familiar with UGA Young Alumni, I'm sure you've heard about our, our trivia nights. And so we move this typically in person to a, a virtual space last September uh, to kick off the football season. It was a ton of fun. So now to kick off to summer, we're back at it again. So mark your calendars for Thursday, June 3rd at 730 for our second Young Alumni Virtual Trivia Night. Um, if you want to test your knowledge and have some friendly competition and fun, this is the event for you. Prizes will be given to the top uh, to the top leaders as well as those who uh, show their bulldog spirit. We hope you uh, put in your put on your red and black and join us for this fun night. It's always great, and you can sign up for this event right now by selecting the link on the event streaming page. And we hope to see you there. Awesome! Awesome. Um, so now, while uh, Peter is still getting cleaned up, let's swap over to the Georgia Funder page and see how everything is going so far for Campus Kitchen. Oh, that is awesome. We are getting really close to our goal. Um, so thank you so much for those of y'all who have already pitched in. And if you haven't, uh, please consider giving a donation and helping us um, get to that $2,500 goal so that we can get uh, campus Kitchen across the finish line for their trailer. 
And let's see. And then uh, we should be back with Peter in just a few minutes. And Marini, thank you so much uh, for plugging the trivia. Um, that's one of our most fun events. Um, and here comes Peter. Hey, good to have you back. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of moved to the other side of the kitchen and uh, taking my apron off. I was about to say, you, you've been working hard, so time to relax. <laughs> um, well, first off, just <laughs> exactly. thank you so exactly. much for being with us tonight um, and walking us through those amazing dishes. I am starving, so I will be firing up my oven as soon as we're done. Cool. Um, so just to put you on the spot, out of everything that we cooked tonight, which of those three would you say is your favorite? Oh, that's that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I have a sweet tooth, so I'm always going to eat dessert. And now that we're grown ups, we can eat dessert first if we want. <laughs> but uh, but also that shrimp dish is uh, that's one of my all time favorites. So uh, I don't know. It's going to be hard to hard to decide. Oh, gosh, you can never really go wrong. All of that paired so well together. Like there's all, all three could have been the right answer. Um, so when you're not in the kitchen cooking for a lot of folks, you know, you're just at home having a, a casual evening. You know, what's one of your favorite go to dishes? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we eat pretty simply at home. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people you know, think that chefs eat pretty elaborate meals at home. But um, you know, when we're just kind of hanging out, um, you know, we're firing up the grill, we're, we're doing some steaks, um, we're, uh, actually, I just got a sous vide, like a circulator, which is, uh, something we've used in the restaurants for a long time, but now they're available for home, um, and pretty reasonable. So I've started playing around with that, but honestly, that's the most experimental I usually get at home. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to beat like a steak on the grill, um, some simple vegetables, a salad. Um, yeah, we, we eat pretty simply, um. So uh, it's, it's usually not too, not too elaborate. Awesome. Uh, now I want a steak too. Um, <laughs> well, we've been, uh, we've been getting great questions coming in. So let's, uh, let's flip it over to, to what our viewers have been asking. Um, yeah. So Stephanie asks, um, what kind of wine would have best paired with, with everything we had tonight? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and, and honestly, like that sherry would have paired really well with uh the whole meal um but you know it's it's the meal overall is a little um it's lighter so I'd, i would probably go with the white personally um mm -hmm. but that shrimp dish has got a lot going on it's got some bold flavors so a bigger uh white wine um you know, thinking a chardonnay would, would probably go well just because all that olive oil has got some richness and uh, the chardonnay will help work through that uh and then you know some people have um pretty strong opinion about chardonnay um, and, you know, you could have a big uh, buttery, oaky California Chardonnay, and that's, some people love that, some people don't. Um, and so there's also beautiful French um, Chardonnays, like I love a Chablis. Um, um, it's going to have some more minerality to it. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, I think either of those, um, a French or a California Chardonnay, that would be my pick, but, uh, but also the Sherry Dawson. Um, and then just piggybacking off of that, you know, if there was, um, if someone's not really a sherry or a wine drinker, um, do you have a, a favorite, maybe like local beer spirit, um, like a mocktail, um, something else? Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, beer is a, gr it, you know, pairs so well with food and it's a bit more forgiving. So, I mean, it would be Tropicalia <laughs> from Creature Comfort. So, um, that would have paired or, um, or Bebo from from creature comforts i mean those would pair really well uh, and also um you know chocolate and dessert like doesn't always you know people think chocolate and red wine um that's not always the best pairing um i think um like chocolate i would have maybe switched to like a port or a madeira um would be a really nice after dinner drink or um honestly there's some some beers like a, a lambic with a little bit of fruit flavor um uh that would pair really well with that dessert Awesome. Let's see. So Hannah asks, um, what are some other of your favorite dishes from when you were in Spain? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, there's a, um, there's a dish of, um, uh, it's actually a dessert and we've done it at the national before, but it was, um, basically they take a pineapple, a fresh pineapple, they cut it in half, leaving the top on, 
um, that, you know, the fronds, uh, and then you cut it again. So you quarter it lengthwise, and then you t cut out the core, and then you cut the center into pieces. Um, it's kind of elaborate, and it's kind of a showstopper when it comes to the table. Um, but they drizzle um, a type of molasses on it, uh, and then um, some lime zest over the top. Um, and so when I recreated it um, here, um, we, we don't really have, we didn't have like the molasses that they were using, but um, uh, cane syrup from South Georgia is made an awesome um, replacement. So fresh pineapple, some South Georgia cane syrup, some um, just grated lime zest over the top. Uh, and then if they're in season, some pomegranate seeds. And, and that's not even really a recipe. It's just, you know, some ingredients and you <laughs> sprinkle on top. But it's so refreshing uh, and just an unusual, unexpected combination. And it's great at the end of the meal because pineapple is great for digestion. Um, so you just, um, you know, you could eat that after the, the chocolate um, and uh, you'd feel really great. So um, that was one of my favorites. I also had some dishes that like I didn't love. Um, I went to Spain when I was uh, a junior at Georgia. We used to be on quarters and so we had this really long December break. So I went to Spain and I went to a little town and had um, I love squid calamari and I ordered a dish because it, it was, you know, it was calamari and I was really pumped about it. And this bowl came and it was like a black pudding. Um, and then you kind of spooned around and found the little pieces of calamari, but the, it was a pudding that was like a made with the squid ink. And it was uh, a little out there for me when I was 20 years old. So that was one of my less enjoyable experiences, but, but by and large, they're, they're awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so Arden asks, uh, what's your process for developing restaurant, uh, developing recipes for your restaurant? Um, I mean, it happens in a lot of different ways. Um, one, probably the most common is, uh, is, is communicating with our farmers. Um, so if the dish is going to have um, like a locally sourced protein or produce, vegetables, um, it's... Uh, you know, we just have constant communication with the farmers. So we have meetings throughout the year to talk about what is in season. Um, there's some farmers that we have commitments to about what we're going to buy um, in the next season. And so they can plan what they're going to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we're looking ahead to, um, you know, what's coming up um, and start planning dishes based on that. Um, so that's really helpful. Um, and then also I'm really inspired by travel and and obviously we haven't done a lot of that in the past year, but looking forward to getting back out there and, and going to, you know, New York, LA, going to Europe when we can. Um, and, and really I gain a lot of inspiration um, by seeing what people are eating in, in other cities and other parts of the world. And then not trying to recreate those dishes, but try, but then um, seeing what we have locally uh, and recreating um, something similar that combines that inspiration with, with what we have around us in North Georgia. Okay. All right. And Seth asks, um, what's the best type of olive oil for everyday use? Um, well, so my friend Randall Abney would, would, he teaches a whole class on olive oil. That's really fantastic. So, um, but, um, you know, I, for everyday use, um, you know, I, I would have two olive oils. Um, one, I would have a nice olive oil, like the oliva that I used on the salad. Um, you know, one that's going to be um, you know, extra virgin, fresh pre uh, first press. Uh, and, you know, if you can go to a store that lets you sample olive oils and find one that you really like. Um, I tend to like ones that are going to be a little pepperier, um, that are going to have, um, it's almost like they'll kind of, you know, I'll just cough a little bit if you, you know, kind of chew a little bit of the olive oil. Um, and it, um, helps, uh, uh, that, that, that pepperiness, that spice is actually mm -hmm. part of the health benefits, that, um, the qualities that, that provide health benefits, um, to you. Um, but it also provides a nice contrast to, to the other items, the other ingredients on your plate. Um, and then for an olive oil that you're going to cook with, um, you know, cooking it like in a shrimp dish, um, that really changes the flavor um, uh, of, of the olive oil. So, um, you know, I'd find like a, you know, a, an olive oil that you like the flavor of, but that's not super expensive. So, um, you know, if, uh, one that I, you can find in almost any uh, grocery store is like mm -hmm. California Olive Ranch. Uh, I think that's a really solid olive oil. Um, it's not crazy expensive. And, and that's one that... Um, uh, that if I don't have something else that I'm that I that I'm into at the moment, um, that I'll pick up for sautéing. So that's a that's a great question. Olive oil is a, olive oil is a tough one. 
Awesome. Yeah, I'm taking notes because I can never seem to pick the right one. So that is fantastic. Um, <laughs> sure. Meg asks, um, what is one ingredient that you couldn't live without? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> one ingredient I couldn't live without. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, you know, one, one that I use a lot and I use it a lot at home is smoked paprika. And um, it's obviously very Spanish, uh, but it really quickly um, gives a lot of depth to a dish because that smokiness um, uh, and it comes in sweet and spicy varieties. So you can do a lot with it. Um, you know, some examples are um, we actually like will stir it into mayonnaise um, and it makes a really great spread for a sandwich um, or to dip fries in. Um, we, of course, use it um, like in a, in a rub, uh, like for a steak or for a pork chop. Um, I mean, it's just got a lot of uses. So um, we use it a lot at the National. Um, and uh, it, it's a good like one to have in your back pocket. Um, and it can be a little tricky to find. If you go to a good supermarket, you'll see it. Um, but yeah, check out some of paprika. Okay. All right. And Angela asks, uh, how did you pick the different concepts for each of your restaurants? Yeah. Um, they honestly all came out of, um, I don't want to say necessity, but, but they were all ideas of, of, of places that we wanted to eat at um, and that we didn't have yet in Athens. So, I mean, the national um, uh, kind of leans Mediterranean and, and I did some of my training in Spain and my dad's half Greek and, you know, just the Mediterranean has always been really inspiring to me. Um, and then we opened Sea Bear Oyster Bar uh, and that, um, we didn't feel like there was like a place to get great oysters back then in Athens. Uh, and so we would travel and, and, and go to other cities and, and hang out at an oyster bar and eat the oysters, but also eat all the other seafood dishes and non seafood dishes and, and just love the vibe and the cocktails and, and wish we had something like that in Athens. And um, uh, so that was kind of the inspiration for that. Um, Condor chocolates was, you know, kind of this idea that we wanted to, to do something with chocolate from Ecuador, from where our mom's from. Um, and you know, my brother was working for a big ag company and wanted to kind of be entrepreneurial. And, and so he, he went in that direction and then Maple, which is uh, the newest, um, you know, there, I was, um, I'll say like working in this industry, there is a lot of temptation there, are, you know, at the national, there was always like a bowl of French fries or like, um, if I was working at night, like I would stand next to a freezer full of ice cream or gelato <laughs> all night long. And so it's just hard to, you know, stay healthy when you have all this temptation, um, even, you know, um, so um, trying to sort of be healthier, um, wanted, um, you know, something that was really quick and not, you know, um, that was convenient, um, but still maybe a lot of vegetables and that, you know, you ate it and felt good. Um, and so that was kind of the, how Maple, the idea was born. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're, we've been really excited about um, bringing that to Atlanta. Um, awesome. Peter. Well, yeah, we've got one, time for one more question. Um, any, uh, any small tips that will have a big impact? Um, small tips for cooking. Um, uh, I would, so I think one thing that's really important that, that home cooks, um, that sometimes home cooks um, don't think about is, um, is seasoning. Um, so having the, you know, salt and pepper and knowing how much you like. So recipes often say, um, you know, salt um, to taste. Um, so just kind of understanding, um, you know, what level of salt and pepper you like. Um, and like salt, for example, like your food shouldn't taste um, salty, but the salt should enhance the other flavors that are on the plate. So, um, you know, experiment and maybe add like a touch more than you might normally and see what happens. Um, and then the other thing is, um, is acid. And I think acid is super key. Um, and, and what maybe makes restaurant food seem different than food at home. Um, so if you have like a piece of meat or something that's kind of rich, having a component um, that contrasts that richness or that meatiness. Um, so whether it's a sauce or just a squeeze of lemon on a piece of fish or, um, you know, like pork chops, like, um, you know, maybe like a little relish that's got some pickle in it. Um, you know, just something that's going to offset um, the, the richness of the dish. So don't forget, uh, don't forget the acid. Uh, so okay. Good to know. Um, well, that brings us to the end of our evening, Peter. We just want to say thank you again for such a wonderful time. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to watch you make all those dishes and, and just to share your talents with all of us. 
Um, I am already looking forward. I know I need to eat healthier, so I cannot <laughs> wait to go to Maypole. And then next time I'm in Athens, you know, National and, and Sea Bear, just to, to round everything out. Um, any parting words for our audience? Um, well, I wish y'all were here because we've got a bunch of food here. So we're about to eat dinner and then uh, finish off with some chocolate budina. So I wish you were here. And uh, if you're ever at one of the restaurants, ask for me and uh, I'd love to say hello. So um, I'll be in Atlanta a lot um, the next few weeks at Maple. So if you're around, um, you know, uh, let them know that you were at this and I'd love to say hello and uh, uh, answer any questions you've got. So and also hit me up on social media um, for sure. And uh, yeah, and thank you awesome. for the support of uh, Campus Kitchen. That, that, that's pretty incredible. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, we appreciate it. We'll let y'all go eat supper. Yeah. Perfect. And like I said, that does bring us to the close of our event tonight. But before we say goodnight, let's do one final check on our Georgia funder. <laughs> All right. We are making great progress. Um, we still have a little bit left to go. So again, thank you to everyone has already con contributed. And if you're still on the fence, um, both our council and Campus Kitchen would really appreciate your help uh, in getting across that finish line. Um, the Georgia Funder is going to stay open uh, through the UGA Giving Week, which starts on April 17th. Um, this is such a great cause that, that already has had a huge impact on the Athens community. Um, and, and with everything that they're they're planning to do in the future, it's just going to uh, be able to touch and benefit so many more people. Um, and finally, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you again to Peter Dale for taking the time this evening to uh, to spend his evening with us, show us some amazing recipes. Um, make sure you visit one of his establishments, whether you're in Athens, Atlanta, um, coming up soon. And then we also want to th uh, thank Kelton and Andy from the UGA Campus Kitchen. Um, it was fantastic just to hear about what they're doing um, with such a wonderful organization that, that's really benefiting uh, the Athens community. Um, and with that, uh, on behalf of the UGA Young Alumni Council, uh, we hope y'all have a great rest of your evening and we'll see y'all at Trivia on June 3rd. Take care and go dogs. <laughs>